So for tonight, we're coming to the last night on the necessary attitudes for recovery. And we've really been trying to emphasize that recovery is more than just doing certain things. It is also having the right attitudes. So there's a lot of people that do the right things but don't have the attitudes, and we call them dry drunks. They're sober, but they're miserable to live with. And they're not growing in their life at all, so they got physical sobriety, but not emotional sobriety. And so what you have to have to really have healthy sobriety and recovery is certain attitudes. And so we've been going through a bunch of attitudes. This one is the tenth and the final one, and it is humility. I would say from my own experience that this is one of the most difficult ones to understand, but one of the most important ones if you're going to make it in recovery. More than that, it's not just important to make it in recovery. You can't have a healthy relationship without it. You can't be a good employee or a good, a good parent without it or a good friend. Without humility you will always damage relationships. That's just reality of life. So this humility is absolutely essential. It is the foundation stone that all good qualities are built from. But it is so hard to understand. And there's a lot of misinformation that's been given about humility. So let me give you two that some of you may have grown up with or heard, sometimes they are given in churches, but some people think this. If I'm humble, that means I walk around saying I'm a terrible person, I can't do anything good, I have nothing to offer, and, and, and they think that being humble means walking around putting yourself down all the time and not feeling good about yourself. That is not humility. So understand that up front, that is a terrible thing, and I'll talk about it later. Another one that many people got growing up was, if I'm humble, I will never talk about any accomplishments that I've made, or I'll never say I'm proud of this accomplishment, or I'm proud of my kids. People go, oh, you're proud. You don't have humility. No, that's a different use of proud. It is not being a proud person as in the opposite of humility. So humility still is able to say, I am proud of this accomplishment. That does not mean you are a humble person, but it's how you say that that determines whether it's humility-based or pride-based. And we'll explain that as we go. So up front, understand that humility is not shame. And that's what a lot of people think, is that shame, which is I'm not good enough, I'm no good, I, I think I'm less than everybody, that is not humility. It is not putting myself down. So that is what I want to clear up. Now I want to give you 12 pieces to a definition of humility. So you need all the pieces to get a full picture, so stick with me, but up, top, up front, big picture, the simplest way I can describe hum humility is this. Humility is seeing myself accurately. That's part one. Part two to that is humility is seeing myself accurately in relation to other people. So it's seeing myself accurately as a person and seeing myself accurately in comparison to other people. So let me now develop that and help you understand that. So humility says this, I see myself accurately and in relation to others that we're all equal. You might be in a higher position than me, but that doesn't make you better than me. We are equal. So there is an equality that is part of being humble. So that means... I'm not less than you, and I'm not greater than you. I'm not better than you. I'm not worse than you. We're equal. That is seeing myself 
accurately. So the opposite of humility is pride. And what pride does, and I like, it's kind of a McDonald's illustration, but pride causes me to downsize everybody to be inferior to me and upsize me to be superior to everybody. That's what pride will do. It wants relationships to be superior and inferior so that there is a better than and a less than person in the relationship. Humility gets rid of all of that. And it says, no, there's no superior, inferior. We are equal. Take that a little bit further. Pride says, my needs are more important than yours. So that whatever the situation is, I want what I want a little more than I want you to get what you want. That's pride. Humility says both of our needs are important. Sometimes, because of the situation and our differences, you'll give in to my needs, and other times I'll give in to your needs, but it'll be about 50 50 because our needs are equally important. Pride doesn't want that kind of relationship, it wants my needs to come ahead of yours. Now, the challenge of complex trauma is that in order to survive when you are in danger, you had to make your needs more important than others in order to survive. And so complex trauma sets a person up for pride. And so the opposite of that is humility. Now there's another thing complex trauma does. Complex trauma is all about humiliation. Where you get put down, made fun of, shamed. That's not humility. So Complex trauma fights against genuine humility. And so it is a new skill to be learned for people coming out of complex trauma. It does not come naturally. So let me take that a little bit further. Humility says we're all equal. It doesn't matter what your position is, how much money you have, how much power you have. Those don't make you superior to me. They might in position, but not as human beings. We are still all equal. Now what pride does, it says, I want to be superior or better than everybody. So it's always having to prove it's better than everybody. So you ever have the guy strutting around that has to keep strutting 20 years later to keep proving he's Mr. Muscle Man and Mr. Bad Boy? And he's always got something to prove. And what I say, if you've always got something to prove, that means you've always got something to lose. And what humility says is, I am who I am. I don't have to prove anything to anybody because I have nothing to lose. That's who I am. So pride isn't able to do that. Now, there's a lot of people that say, I don't have pride. I think I'm a humble person. And so what I have to do in working with people is help them understand some of the subtle forms of pride. So here's a test for you. Subtle form of pride, number one, is I treat you like you're my equal, but in my head I'm putting you down all the time. I'm cutting you up, criticizing you, and making you inferior to me in my head. So pride doesn't always verbalize what it thinks it sometimes just thinks and that is still pride okay now let me take that to the next part of humility humility doesn't mean i become a doormat humility doesn't mean okay i'm your equal or maybe i should put my needs aside and, and take care of your needs so i'll let you walk all over me that is not humility at all. That is the recipe for abuse. Humility respects itself so much that it will stand up and fight for itself. It will not lay down and accept disrespect or abuse. And that is a new way of thinking for a lot of people. Shame says, 
I will be a doormat. I don't have needs. I don't matter. Walk all over me. Abuse me. Just give me a few crumbs of love and then I'll let you keep abusing me. Humility says, no, I am your equal. I will not let you treat me like I'm your inferior. I will stand up and fight for myself. Now, there's a word that gets misused by a lot of people, especially in churches, and it's called submission. And submission means that I place my desires aside and submit to somebody else's wishes, okay? And so what many people think is, if I'm a good partner in a relationship, I should be willing to give up my needs and submit to the needs and desires of the other person. And I say, yes, that is what submission means, but you have to understand this. Relationships only work if both people submit. If only one is submitting, that is an abusive relationship. Healthy relationships are two people submitting to each other, and it balances out to 50-50. And that is what many people miss. So if you're doing all the submitting and the other person isn't doing any, that is not a healthy relationship. So another way to say it is this. A healthy relationship requires two humble people. If you have one humble person and one proud person, never going to be a healthy relationship. Take that further. Love comes from humility. So to have a loving relationship, you need two humble people because only humble people can truly love. And so that is absolutely essential. Next part of humility. Humility is that I am always teachable. I always want to learn. I always want to receive input, constructive criticism in order to continue to grow. Now here's what I found with people from complex trauma. You like to be taught by somebody you respect. But if it's somebody you don't respect, you're not learning one thing from them. Because you have zero respect for them. What humility does is this. It says, I want to grow and I am willing even to take input from people I don't respect. Now, it doesn't mean I take everything they say as fact. I will evaluate what they say just like I evaluate what anybody says to make sure it is accurate, but I am willing to learn from everybody. And that is humility. Next one, humility is willing to admit when it's wrong. It's willing to own failure. It is willing to apologize. It is willing to humble itself and say, my bad, my mistake. So, this again is where it gets tricky. A lot of us are willing to apologize to people we respect. We're just not going to apologize to people that annoy us. And humility says, if I hurt somebody that annoys me, I'm still going to apologize. Even though they might then rub my nose in it, I still am willing to own my stuff. Next one. Don't know how you're doing so far in this whole humility thing, but I'll keep plow plowing along. Humility is willing to accept weakness, my own weakness. Shame says, there's parts of me I hate. There's parts of me I don't accept. Parts of my personality, parts of my body. Do you want to know what that is? That is pride. Humility says, I accept all of me, I accept this package and all its warts and all of its faults and flaws. Doesn't mean I want to stay the same way forever, but I accept where I am, I accept my limitations, I'm okay with me. That is ultimately what humility is saying. I am okay with this package. Pride says... I'm not okay with my weaknesses because they make me look bad. I'm not okay with things that people kind of chuckle about that make me a bit of an odd duck. 
I don't like that. That's pride concerned about image. And so pride is always wanting to look good. And one of the things that pride does, if it doesn't accept itself, it's constantly needing to compare itself to others. In order to see, am I doing a little better than them? How Am I coming out as being a bit superior to them? Humility doesn't need to compare itself to others. Because it's okay with who it is. Next thing, when we fail, pride beats itself up. It says, you loser, you can't do anything right. I'm going to punish you. That's pride in action. Humility says, I failed. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to change. And I'm going to forgive myself. And then move on and learn from it. That's humility. It's pride dressed up like humility that puts itself down. Now, accepting yourself is one thing. Humility also accepts others. Pride can't tolerate annoying people. Pride can't tolerate imbeciles who are so slow to catch on and incompetence. It can't tolerate that. Humility says, you know what? We're human. We're messed up. Let's accept each other. Let's grow together. I'll be patient with you. Please be patient with me because I'm not going to get it right the first time. Do you want to know why pride doesn't like incompetent people? Because number one, it makes them look bad. Number two, it takes too long to train them. And some of you would have had a mother that says, here, help me cook. And after one minute, because you made a mess and you di didn't know how to do it first perfectly, she says, get out of here and let me do it. That is impatience with limitations. And that is pride. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you come home from work and you've had a busy week and you're kind of tired and you get home and you sit down to supper and the kids spill the milk. Now that happens. Kids are kids. What pride says is you're messing up my evening. You're inconveniencing me right now. I not want everybody to behave in a way that suits my agenda right now. And if you don't, I will blow up at you. That's pride in action. Or let's say you had agreed earlier in the week that the kids could have a sleepover with friends. And now it's Friday night and you're tired and all the kids come home over for a sleepover. And they are noisy and they are yelling and carrying on. Pride would say, get out of here, or shut up, or whatever, and come down heavy-handed. Humility says, you know what? It's just as much right for them to live in this house as me. We agreed to this plan. I accepted it. They've been looking forward to this. I need to put my agenda aside tonight and honor their agenda. That's humility. Pride doesn't want to do that. It wants everything to revolve around its agenda. Okay, we're moving along. Next one. Humility celebrates successes of other people. It is excited when other people fulfill their giftedness and their abilities and they achieve stuff and they succeed. They're so excited about that. We're glad to see others doing well. Pride sees others as a threat. And so if somebody that you see as a competition succeeds, you get a resentment going. Because they might, they might kind of cloud you out and you might get overshadowed by them. But humility is willing and wants to celebrate the success of others. So again, questions. How do you feel when somebody gets more praise than you do? especially when there's your competition. And how do you feel when your competition gets people admiring their gifts and they're not doing the same to you? Or all of those, humility versus pride. Next one, and complex trauma messes with this one as well. 
Humility says, I can grow and meet most of my needs, but I will always have some needs where I need others. I am not totally self-sufficient I am always going to be somewhat dependent on others for help. Pride says, I can never have a need because then others might look down on me. Complex trauma says, I can never be a burden or a pain to other people because then they will resent me. So I can't others. I have to try and be self-sufficient. The problem is I can't be. I can't meet all of my needs by myself. And so humility is willing to allow others to help them. And it is willing to reach out for help from others so that others are able to help us. I've talked with thousands of people with complex trauma, as you know. And I've asked them, how do you feel when somebody gives you a gift? Because they know you're in need. And so a lot of them say, I now feel like I owe them. That they are one up on me because they've given me something and now I'm in their debt. So I got to give them something back to make it even again. That's complex trauma. Humility says, if I'm in need and somebody gives me something, I'm just grateful. And I express my gratitude. And I don't sense and don't, don't feel strings attached. And I'm able to go with that. Next one. Humility is willing to serve. Now this one is tricky. So let me explain it to you. A lot of people are willing to serve as long as it makes them look good. As long as it benefits them. Pride loves to serve and always be in a helper role because then they get adored by people and they feel better than other people. So a lot of proud people are helpers. But humility says, I will need to be served and I will accept people serving me. But my basic outlook on life and approach to life is a servant's attitude. I'm not here for what I can get out of people. I'm here for what I can give. And I want to be sensitive and alert to needs and help where I can help. Now here's where it gets tricky. There is a very subtle difference between codependency and love. They look the same in many areas. Codependency is I love you and I'm going to serve you and serve you and serve you. But deep, deep down, I'm doing it so that you'll like me, so that you'll love me back, so you'll value me. That is so subtle, but that is not true humility. Okay, we'll keep going and not beat that one up. <clears throat> we talked about <clears throat> it doesn't brag. Now, let me give you the reverse thing, okay? Okay. So it's okay, a humble person can say, hey, I got this award, I'm so grateful, I'm thankful. But it recognizes, I didn't get this award just because of my ability. I got this award because God wired me that way. Because I got a whole bunch of people that have supported me and taught me and helped me. So I don't take all the credit, but I am glad I got it. That's humility, Okay. And it's able to show off our kids, etc. Pride is all about the image. But there's this reverse pride. I don't know if you've met people, but you go up and you give them a compliment and they go, oh, I'm just a terrible loser. I can't do anything right. And, and you know what they're doing? They're saying, please tell me how great I am. And they're, they're kind of fishing for a compliment. So pride can actually walk around putting itself down, hoping people will tell them how wonderful they are. That's just pride dressed up to look like humility. But humility celebrates success, but doesn't take all the credit. It gives credit where credit is due. And one of the things that I look for in people when they have humility is you kind of get to a point you can laugh about how odd you are. 
your idiosyncrasies, etc. It, it doesn't embarrass you. It's just, yeah, that's me, etc. Okay, finally, humility always will have gratitude. Pride says, I'm entitled. You owe me. I should have this. Humility says, if I got what I deserved, <laughs> it wouldn't be a pretty picture. And I am just grateful for the good things that I have. Okay, let me end with three observations. Number one, pride which says make life all about me. Let me get my agenda and my needs above everybody else's. That on the surface looks like the recipe for happiness. Because if I just had whatever I wanted and, and all of my desires gratified, surely I would be the happiest person in the world. Not so. You'd have some pleasure for a while, but you want to know what happened? You would become empty and a prisoner to your dark desires. So pride promises happiness, but delivers pain. Humility, if you look at it, you go, oh, this looks like a death sentence. Putting my needs equal to others, serving people, having a heart that is wanting to learn and open to correction. That looks like a recipe for pain. It leads to happiness. So there's a paradox. Pride promises one thing, delivers the opposite. Humility looks like it's going to deliver one thing, but it gives you what you're looking for. So let me give it to you this way. Humility is willing to give, put myself in a place where I am all the things that I said, and it creates fear in me that my needs won't get met. All of those things will happen inside of me. It will feel like weakness, but it will bring the life I'm looking for. And that, there, therefore, is why I say it is the root, the foundation stone of every good thing in life. Now, let me give you a final thing. And this one, I wished I had learned as a younger man. We, when we think about humility and pride, most people think of an emotion. Do you realize that humility is not an emotion? Humility is a choice. So guess what's going to happen tomorrow? My wife and I will be at home together. All day, she's going to be in the same house as me. And our wishes and desires aren't going to match up every single minute of the day. And what that means is two things. Number one, she's going to annoy me at times, and I'm going to annoy her. And that's going to result in me saying, I want what I want. Give in to me. I can make a choice. And I can say, I can choose to be humble here. I can choose to see her needs and her desires as just as equal as mine, I might not feel humble, but I can still act humble. And what I have found is as I choose to see myself accurately and see others as equal and respect myself and stand up for myself properly and place my needs in the right balance with others' needs, slowly I feel better about things. But initially, I don't enjoy any of it. I, I'm kind of mad and upset when I'm doing all of that. But I choose to act in a humble way. So humility begins with a choice. And that leads to all the other stuff. Okay, that is that huge concept. I hope it gives you some understanding. I think for most of us, we walk away going, I got a lot to learn in this area. And I just wish you the best. So as usual, I want to take the topic from the first half and say, is there a Bible story that illustrates humility? And there is, and it's one that you may have heard growing up. There's a guy in the Bible that goes by the name of Naaman. And if you ever heard the story in Sunday school, he was the guy that had leprosy and was told to dip seven times in the Jordan River. So I want to tell you that story. And what I want you to understand is 
what it shows us that the, the door that he had to go through to get healing and his life sorted out was a very humble door. Everything in the story is about humility and the importance of humility. And it illustrates addiction and recovery so beautifully that I hope you'll see clearly that as well. So what I want you to understand is I'm going to talk about Naaman with leprosy. You translate it into your head. You in the problem with addiction. Okay? So let me read you the brief little story and then I'll explain it to you. So it says the king of Aram, and that's modern, modern day Syria, had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. So what I want you to understand that is that he was one of the highest, most important people in Syria. He was the commander of the army, and he had won great victories. So what that meant was, when he gave commands, people listened. He was used to being obeyed. He was used to having people under him take orders. He took, he took orders from very few people, because that's how high up he was. More than that, he was adored. He had led Syria in battle after battle, which led to victory after victory. So there were parades that honored his leadership. And so he was revered. People would bow before him. People would stop and honor him. He was used to all of that. He traveled in kind of what we would call a limousine, a chariot. So he got special treatment by the government Special treatment all the way around. That was what he was used to. That was his life. And so with that came great position, power, wealth, everything that most people think will lead to greatness and happiness and what they aim for and dream for. But on the outside, though he looked great, he had a secret. And that was leprosy. And what you have to understand about leprosy is, in that culture, it was an incurable disease. So once you got it, there was not a remedy. And so you just got worse and worse very gradually. So first your finger would drop off, then you would get sores on your face, then your nose would get infected and fall off. And gradually it would become visible. So as long as you could keep it hidden and a secret, you could still keep your job. But once it became known and that secret got out, everything fell apart. And so you can, again, picture yourself in addiction when it's starting to get worse and worse. So you can keep it hidden for a while and kind of keep others from noticing it and think you're pulling off this double life okay, and, and you're hiding it and going to work and functioning, and everybody still respects you, but you know deep inside it's getting worse. And that creates some fear inside of you. And so you start to worry, how long can I hold it all together? And that's what Naaman was worried about. How long before the secret gets out? Because he knew the minute he couldn't hide it anymore... He would lose everything. Everything he valued. In that culture, once that your leprosy came out, you would be sent to the countryside to live by yourself. So he would lose his job, his position, his wealth, his prestige, his power, his family, his children. Everything that he valued would be gone. Isn't that an amazing parallel to what happens in addiction? You try to keep it together, try to keep it a secret, but you know the day that I can't keep this a secret anymore, I'm going to lose everything. And that is a terrible day. So another way to look at Naaman is this. Here's a guy that could help thousands of people, but he couldn't help himself. And that's the powerlessness that many addicts feel. I can help people on my job. I'm good at what I do. I just can't help conquer my own demons. And so that 
is where we come to the next part. On one of the military campaigns, they went into Israel and they conquered a part of Israel. And Naaman brought back a little Jewish girl thinking this would be a great servant girl for my wife at home. She'll be a slave. And so he brings back this little girl. So she is one of the first people that finds out about his secret that he can't hide any longer. And so when she sees her to fall apart, is a man, Naaman, sir, there is a man in Israel, a prophet of God, who I know can heal your leprosy. You've gone to every doctor in Syria. You've checked out every other thing. Nothing has worked. But I know there's one person who could help you. And his name is Elisha. Now here is Mr. High and Mighty, the top of the ladder, a servant girl who's at the very bottom. Make that even worse. In number two, she is a girl. Number two, every one of those would make her lower than the lowest in Naaman's mind. And so it would have been easy to just say, I'm not even paying attention to that little girl. I am above anything that she can say. Okay, now let me stop and do a little aside here. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of that little girl. So just go back a couple years when you've been taken from your military. Imagine you a slave. Imagine how easy it would have been for that little girl to become bitter. And that little girl, if she had become bitter, what would she have done when Naaman's secret came out? She would have said, Good, I hope he dies. I will not help him at all. But this little girl has some kind of faith in God that says, I trust that God brought me for some purpose and she actually, and she actually cared. That is amazing to me. But what she is saying and what we all need to say for people from complex trauma is even though I was in painful circumstances and I might still be in painful circumstances, God has placed me in the exact spot that I need so that I can serve him now. And I can accept that and trust him. And that's what that little girl did. So if that little girl had been bitter, about the cure and to do that. Okay, now what happens next is such an important part. So again, go back into Naaman's mind, hearing this young girl say, go to Israel, your enemy, and go to a prophet of God, and he'll heal you. He is thinking like this. In that culture, a nation that conquered another nation, the reason they believed they conquered that nation was because they're then that nation's God. It's stronger than your gods. Your God is in So everything in his mind would reject what that young girl just told him. Then he might say, I have leprosy. I don't need some spiritual thing. I don't need a God. I need a doctor. And so that would have been easily in his mind. And then, who are you? You're just a punk kid that knows nothing. Why would I follow your advice? So now there's two main issues that... I th is doing this in her life. Issue number one is this. Naaman, you say you want to be cured. How badly do you want it? I say to addicts all the time, you say you want to get cured. How badly do you want it? Are you willing, Naaman, to do something silly, like go to a foreign nation? Because if you're not willing to perceive as silly, you might not want it bad enough. Stuff you've never done before that feels silly. How are you willing to do that? A secret. If you're not willing to do that, you might not want it badly enough. Are you willing to go out of your known world into an unknown world? That's a scary transition. Do you want it badly enough? Because that's what it's going to take. Are you willing to take advice from people that you previously looked down on? That's necessary. In other words, do you want it badly enough to... 
Naaman, I am going to give you one humility test after another in order to see if you are willing to humble yourself because it's only people who are willing to humble themselves who are able to get the cure. So the cure isn't a magic fix. The cure that lasts and changes your life isn't just going to a doctor for a pill. The cure is heart. That's where to take God sets it up to take Naaman from this proud, lofty position and take him on a journey that says we are going to go to the place that you fear, dread, that feels like death to you, but that is the starting point of life. Are you willing to do it? So watch what he does. Are you willing, number one, to go to the nation you just conquered and ask for help? That is, so here's what Naaman does. He goes to Israel, and guess where he goes for help? To the palace of the king. He says, I'm going to go to another big wig. And I'm going to talk to another big person that's got as much power as me. That's where I'm going to look for my help. And when the king, when he shows up at the king, the king goes, I can't help you. And he gets all freaked out. And then he says, you better go see Elisha. Now, he, now he, and bow before Naaman and say, you are greater than me. How can I serve you? Do you want to know what Elisha does? He doesn't even come out of his house. He sends his servant to say, what do you want? And Elisha's going, whoa, do you know who I am? You should be treating me with some respect here, not sending me, your servant, to come and ask me what I want. And God says, how badly do you want it? To lower yourself, to take help from people you look down on, that you see is totally insignificant, are you willing to go there? And he listened. And then Elisha didn't even come out. He says, go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Now, if I was told to do that, my initial response would be, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And that was the point. So here's a couple things that I want you to get with that. The Jordan River is a very, it's the only river through Israel, and it's a very muddy river at times of the year. In Syria, they've got some beautiful clean rivers. And, and so what Naaman says is, I could go back and dip in the rivers at home that are nice and clean. I don't want to dip in this dirty river and get some infection and all of that. And then seven to stop, and yet, try, we'd be after the third time. Okay, nothing, nothing's, I give up point to it. It's just, are you willing, I ask you to do, to do whatever you take. Are you willing to humble yourself? That's what it took. And so God is basically saying the door to a new life is really, really low. You got to stoop to get through that door to a new life. Naaman, are you willing to stoop to the level you need to stoop to get to a new life. And you want to know what happened? It's kind of a neat little piece to this whole thing. After Naaman went to the Jordan River, grumbling all the way, his, his, his advisors had to kind of talk him into going there and talk him down because he was ready to quit and go home. And they said, give it a chance. All of that. And, and he went there and he got cured. Seventh time he came out of the Water and the leprosy was gone. You want to know what happened? At that point in time, he said, I want Israel's God to be my God. So he didn't just get cured physically. He got cured spiritually. And so a double miracle happened. In that moment when he was prepared to humble himself and follow the direction of that God... He entered a relationship with that God. And so the problem we all have is we think we're smarter than God. We think we should be treated a certain way and we can only lower ourselves to do things that we're comfortable with. Recovery says you try to live that way, you're never going to make it. You have to be willing to stoop through a pretty low door 
and enter into the unknown, do stuff that you think is silly, take advice from people you looked down on in, in the past. But if you're willing to humble yourself and do that, like Naaman, you enter a life that will have recovery and healing, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let's pray. Father, what a beautiful example of the value of humility, the need for humility, and how foreign it is to us, how unnatural, how we resist it. And I just pray you would help us to humble ourselves before you, the great God, and find life and a relationship with you there. Amen. Okay, that's the end of this part of the evening. We have a break.